hope that the information which you receive will be of some value to you. As you know, we've just finished dealing with our introduction to the Course in order to gain understanding about what this Course is all about. And now we move to a consideration of knowledge based upon that understanding about what this course is all about. So let us move to the subject matter of this course, to that packet of material that I gave you entitled Theological Meaning of Preaching. Now, as we've indicated before, we say here that our knowledge consideration of this course will involve two big concepts that we will try to get some understanding about prior to our delivery of sermons in this course next semester. And one of these big concepts is a theological interpretation of what preaching is from a divine point of view, and the other being a psychological and sociological interpretation of what homiletics is from a human point of view. For we need plenty of light on both of these great concepts so that we can do our sermon delivery here as men preaching in the light. Because we ain't got to turn you loose until we see some things together here in the light. Now as we come to deal with this first area of subject matter, namely preaching, we are acutely aware of the need for a clarified definition. Know deeply in our heart that we need to reach certain agreements about what we mean when we use the word preaching. For without clarified definition and without common agreements on what we will mean by the term preaching, we could be speaking in unknown tongues to each other and not really be communicating. And that would indeed be tragic. For with the world in the fix that it is, with all kinds of gaps in communication, from the generation gap to the international gap, in the parents Paris peace talks, with all of these communication gaps existing and filing us up, we have no time to waste here in a tower of Babel, confusion of tongue type of experience. No time to add to the confusion in this course. Now let me further clarify what I mean by a definitional need here in this course through an, through an example. And that example is example number two under item C on your outline. And by the way, it would be well for you to follow your outline along with this discussion. So if you don't have it, go get your outline. Turn this off and go get your outline. And follow me with that outline. I think it will be more helpful. Now that example that I want to use to clarify what I mean by our need to have good definition is this. I remember some five years ago at our annual conference, just before the 1964 General Conference, when Jack Leg preachers 
from all over the district and all over the country with high ambitions in the church came crawling into our annual conference from everywhere, seeking our endorsement, our support for their high ambitions. Now, just to be perfectly frank, I'd much rather vote for Governor Wallace and General Curtis LeMay for President and Vice President of the United States than to have put my endorsement on some of that jack-legged trash we had blowing all over our annual conference five years ago. Much rather have voted for Wallace and Maddox than to give my endorsement on some of that jack-legged trash seeking endorsement in the name of God. Well, anyway, I remember a particular Jack Leg who was looking in on our meeting with the hope of making an impression so that he could get our conference endorsement for a high connectional position for which he was running. Now, why should I use the word running well, snakes don't run, they crawl. Well, anyway, uh, he must have popped enough cash into somebody's hand because the bishop gave him his golden opportunity to show us what he could do by turning him loose on us to bring the noonday message. And that's exactly what the bishop did. Turn that something loose on us that afternoon, the bishop said, Sick him! And the jack leg did sick us. Now you see the different spelling on these two words, sick. Sick him, said the bishop. And the jack leg did S I C K up. But when that jack leg got through, hawking and spitting, for 55 minutes, what seemed like nearly 55 years, I found that I had an acute case of spiritual indigestion. My spiritual belly feeling mighty, mighty low. There's something in it that didn't agree with me. That would not digest spiritually. And I knew that my spiritual illness in my belly was serious. But nothing like, like no spiritual anacin or, or spiritual buffering or spiritual peptobismol could help me out in my pitiful spiritual condition as a consequence of all that slump I had in my spiritual belly. I was sick, real sick, spiritually. From that slop that that jack leg, jack leg had served for our spiritual lunch. Well, while I was suffering from an acute case of spiritual heartburn at the dinner table, a sweet old sister sitting across from me uh, said something to me like this. Lord, did me preach to us this afternoon. And that did it. That statement made me puke spiritually. <laughs> well, how could I keep that spiritual puke down in my spiritual belly when somebody else was trying to put some more of that nasty pukey stuff in my spiritual belly? Lord, did he preach? This afternoon. Did you hear what she said? She called that mess preaching. Now, how much is a man supposed to take without losing his temper? So I could not agree with her that that was good preaching. 
and made it my business to articulate that I would not and could not be dishonest enough to agree with her. On that side show, being good preaching. Now, we didn't break up friendship about that fundamental disagreement. But it took some long, hard dialogue to keep from breaking it up. She had her idea of good preaching. And I sure let her know that I had an infinitely different qualitative idea of what good preaching is as over against her idea. No, we didn't break up friendship. But we didn't agree. Neither. Now that is merely one of a thousand living examples that indicates that we often fail to communicate even in using the same words in the same English-speaking country, in the same school, and in the same denomination. She and I were both raised in the Amy Church. And she had her idea of preaching. And I had an infinitely different idea of preaching. And we were both AMEs. Now there are two reasons why we often fail to communicate. On the one hand, we often fail to communicate because of experiential differences, even in using the same words. Such as, for example, uh, when I say uh, dog, you might be accustomed to thinking of a feline animal that climbs trees and running from cani canines that purrs, that likes milk, and says meow. So a dog would be meaning meow to you and would be meaning bow wow to me. And we would not be communicating about what a D-O-G means because of our experiential differences. On the other hand, we often fail to communicate because of carelessness in using words vaguely. Carelessness in not defining or specifying precisely what we mean in using words. For instance, suppose we as a class decided to cooperate in making a pie. We're going to have some fellowship. Go fellowship in making a pie and fellowship in eating the pie. We have a good time as a class. And suppose each of us decided to bring one of the ingredients for that pie. With Ike Hentrell and I delegated to bring the fruit for the pie. Because after all, you see, uh, Hentrell and I are supposed to be uh, good buddies. You need to vomit on that, too, because you know that ain't true. Well, anyway, suppose on the pie-making day, Sunday afternoon, when all the grocery stores are closed by Holy Lester's decree, shutting down everything, doors caving, have uh, giveaway, give, uh, giveaways there. They can't drink when you want to. So the stores are closed by Lester's Holy Decree. And Ike Hentrell and I shows up, uh, show up. And Ike Hentrell shows up with three peaches. And I show up with three apples. Now we both brought fruit for the pie project. Different fruit, but still fruit. for the pie-making project. Now what is going to happen when the rest of the class wants to know who messed up? Right. Some lying and some finger-pointing is going to take place between Hentrell and me. For it is evident that Hentrell messed up. 
because he knew that everybody had in mind apple pie, I would say. And of course, Hentrell would have to defend his self. He would say, uh, lyingly, you know he lied. No, Doc, you don't want messed up, because everybody knew that we had in mind peach pie. So there we would be, pointing accusing fingers at each other, like Adam and Eve in the garden, after their sin, merely because we all fail to define or signify precisely the kind of fruit desired in our pie-making project. So for two reasons, we often fail to communicate. Experiential differences in using words and because we are careless in using words vaguely. Now, in order to minimize our experiential differences and to minimize using words without specifying precisely what we mean, we will set up two basic working definitions for this course. One for the word preaching and the other for the word homiletics. Now, to be sure, these two basic working definitions which I will set up will not be perfectly pleasing to all concerned. And these two, but these two imperfect working definitions will have one thing going for them, for them namely the power to make communication of two ideas possible in our midst. And it is this practical value of communication that is the basis for setting them up as a norm for this course. So please be advised that these working definitions can be revised on the basis of your critical contribution, just that they have been revised and improved from year to year already. Because I'm going to test you on these two definitions have you to criticize them. And if you come up with something meaningful, I will certainly be happy to revise these definitions and make them more meaningful as a consequence of your contribution. So let us now take up our latest, latest version of our working definition of preaching and give it a thoroughgoing fivefold Theological interpretation, plumbing the length and breadth and heights and depths of five essential parts of this basic working preaching formulation so that we can be communicating with each other with one mind when we mention the word preaching. Now, if you will look at the top of the page of your outline, the top of page one, you will find the first part of our fivefold definition having to do with divine activity. Now, by indicating that preaching is, first of all, divine activity, we're concerned to eliminate a serious fellow about what preaching is at the get-go. To explode a fallacious, fallacious myth at the get-go about what preaching really is at its deepest level. Now, you know what a fallacy is. Well, if you don't, let me tell you. A fallacy is not just a common error. Not something that we do uh, like 2 plus 2 uh, in our addition and cooking up a 3. That's a common error. It will always add right. Fallacy is not a common error. It is a unique kind of error. Well, fallacy is a unique kind of error 
that seems to be true on the surface, but which when it's inspected carefully is found to be purely and utterly false at the deepest level. And that is why fallacies catch suckers by the carloads each and every day of our lives. But what seems to many people to be true on the surface is often accepted and lived with as if it were true in death. And you know, and I know, and God knows that all that glitters is not gold. So fallacies have been catching suckers by the carloads from the dawn of human history up to and definitely including, most definitely including now. For most of us are still very much like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, by, dazzled by that fallacious but forbidden fruit, and fooled in depth by it, because it seems to be good on the surface. Seems like it ought to be good. Looks like just what we need. Smells like it came directly from Hidden Stowe House. Feel like it too. And I did it. And got up close to it now, and I'm going to feel it. And you know how most of us colored folks are. Feeling is the ultimate test. But what makes us feel good is often considered to be good. And we buy it for a living on the basis of what it feels like. So on the basis of what it seemed to be, what it felt like, they did eat of that fallacious but forbidden fruit. And they soon found out that that fruit wasn't the same in depth that it appeared to be on the surface. Yes, indeedy, their eyes were open then when they had that fruit in their belly. They began to see the light then. But what seemed on the surface to be an eternal blessing was found in reality to be nothing but misery and death, death in the depths of their soul that snapped their crazy teeth on a fallacy, had gotten hold of something in their mouths that didn't agree with them in their greedy guts, had been fooled in depth by what seemed to be good on the surface, but which in reality was spiritual poison for the destruction of their souls. Now you know that Adam and Eve were not the last ones to be fooled in depth by a fallacy. For many of us right here in this class, including me, have been fooled in depth, depth by many fallacious teachings about what preaching really means. For all too frequently, many of us have been led uh, to, to be confused that good preaching is what is being done by the vocal cords of the human art. Fallaciously doped into putting emphasis upon what the man in the pulpit with his nasty car on backwards is doing, rather than upon the divine activity going on in our midst. Many of us still being fooled in depth about good preaching. Just like that sweet old lady at our annual conference five years ago. Love 
did he preach? We say, because he put on a side show. And really, there was nothing in the depth coming from God in that circus of fallacy. So remember that definition of the term fallacy. For I will be using that word a lot around here and also will be putting it on the test around here. So don't forget what a fallacy means. It means that what seems to be true on the surface is bound to be false in the depth. It is that kind of error which often fools people, not just a pure, blatant lie, but a lie dressed up in the outer garments. That seemed to be true. Now, to be sure, preaching does often involve human speech. God being gracious enough to permit us humans to get in on His divine activity. But here, we're not referring to that obvious human element that is often going on when we commonly say, Someone is preaching. Not referring to that noise that we often hear coming from a dormitory room when we often say, so-and-so is practicing his preaching. But rather, we are deliberately referring here to the less obvious divine activity behind all genuine preaching. Not to what you and I might be doing but to the less obvious reality of what God himself must be doing to make genuine preaching actually possible. For even if the human speaking is fixed nicely, and we do have many silver tongue orders who can really fix it nicely, and many young bucks now in training Visibly rehearsing to be able to fix it nicely. But even if it is fixed nicely, we are still saying here that preaching is not merely human oratory. Not even real nice human oratory. Fixed up nicely, as we say. For preaching, by definition, involved merely human speech, then every time anybody said anything at all, then that, by definition, would be preaching. And you know, and I know, and God knows that preaching is not taking place by every dumb Tom, Dick, and Harry that runs his lying mouth. So here we're making it abundantly clear at this first element of our definition that even though preaching does sometimes involve human speaking attending it, preaching, nevertheless, cannot be defined primarily in terms of mere human speaking. For there is something else far more significant to preaching than mere human oratory, even if that human oratory is fixed nicely. For instance, uh, Billy Graham stresses this far more significant divine element when he often says something like this. There are two speeches being made here tonight. One that you hear with your physical ears, my speech, and the other that you don't hear with your physical ears, God's speech. Meaning that God himself is moving in our midst tonight, interpreting my stammering speech to the deeper recesses of your being tonight. Yes, indeed, God himself is part 
and parcel of the divine drama of preaching. God himself, the Holy One of Israel, acted in claiming, calling, judging, convincing, convicting, persuading us in the divine activity of preaching. So once again, the creation story is renewed and continued and retold in the divine activity of preaching. Creation again taking place as it was in the beginning. For in preaching, God himself again is moving over the chaos and the void in our lives. And saying once again, let there be light and life in us. Thus, this is why we're beginning our definition of preaching in the same way that the book of Genesis began. Beginning with God Himself. The basic, fundamental, essential premise behind every noble activity in life. Including preaching. In the beginning of preaching, God moves over our chaos and our void and says, let there be light. And only when God does say, let there be light in preaching, will there be any light. Therefore, it means that we, as proclaimers, are under divine obligation to keep this basic, fundamental, essential premise clear before men at all times. We must make it known to all that we are merely the supporting cast and not the main attraction in genuine preaching. Like the singers and dancers who first appear on the stage when the Red Skelton show comes on, 